Uh, and singing sweet, inside your chest, are the little birds of happiness. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. It was a lot of people putting this event together, and we got some great video clips and photos, and we can all work together after this, whoever wants to, to create some content and media and get it out there. All right, take it away. Thanks, Sam. Give it up for Sam, everyone. Give it up for yourselves for being here. I know this is the middle of a Tuesday. Um, so thanks for coming out. And I wanted to invite the people who met with the Canadian consulate earlier today to come up and take a seat on the stage. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we have a cross-border organizing working group delegation that um, had a meeting with the Canadian consul earlier to talk about Line 5 and concerns with other Enbridge tar sands pipelines and the imminent threat that they pose to the Great Lakes and all life in this region. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to introduce um, the delegation that we had, the representatives, and then we're going to hear um, sort of from each one about their experience, uh, any thoughts that they want to share, open it up for a question and answer about this action. And then we also have a few other speakers um, that we're really excited to hear from to talk about you know, what it's like to live in impacted communities. And that will be sort of following this panel. So everyone knows where we're going, where we're at now. Um, first, I want to start by inviting uh, Joe Hill, Anandaga, Anandawaka, thank you. Anandawaka, uh, also Seneca Turtle Clan, coming from Cataruga Territory? Cataragas Territory. Thank you for your help with the enunciation. Um, and he also mentioned he's an attorney. Nyawaskano, Dagwego, Gayuji Gayaso. Hot Noa Garangaskano. What I just said in the Onandawaka or Seneca language, I introduced myself by my longhouse name and uh, told you I'm a member of the Turtle Clan and I come from Garangaskano because Cataragas is as close as the white man could get to get in Gascono, which means that the creek stinks. Um, we're also known for having the first commercial oil well on our territory at Oil Springs. It's still there. Um, I guess I just wanted to remind the uh, consulate of uh, diplomatic relations that predate uh, the Canadian government, that predate the United States government. Um, and I'll show it to you. Hold that. What I have here is a, say, replica of our one dish with one spoon treaty belt. This is a central principle of our great law of peace, which brought us together at a time of uh, tremendous strife in our world um, and showed us a new way to live together. And that new way of living together was used in large part by a young country that came to be called the United States because they took our form of governance 
and turn it into the U.S. Constitution, but they kept out some very important things, like the women were the decision makers. The women could tell us what to say, and we were bound to listen to them. Why? Because they can bring forth life. And as doing so, that meant that they were, in a way, more important than men. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, though. Uh, so I asked the consulate to hold this belt. Um, I should say this. These are clay polymer beads, so it is a replica. However, the night before I was leaving my home in Buffalo, New York, to go to Line 3, I asked my friend if he had a replica of the one dish. Because it's a treaty made with the Anishinaabe, the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and the Haudenosaunee at Montreal in 1701. And at first he said, yeah, I have a plastic one. Um, I said, well, whatever you have, man, I'd like to have just to take a visual representation of it. Because it's easier to talk about it when you have a visual, visual representation than when you're just trying to, oh, the belt. I can see it. But if the people I'm talking to can't see it, they don't understand as well what I'm talking about. Because it's a monomic device. These belts were taken from us and kept in museums. They were kept in museums because they figured we'd forget. We'd lose the stories. We wouldn't be able to read the belt anymore. And reading the belt means that we recite those important concepts contained within the oral history that these items represent. So the next morning, as I was filling up on gas in my buddy's stays, place, he brought this out and he said, oh, he wants me to tell you that the beads that he used for the spoon in the middle are from around 1650. <laughs> so these are the, the, the white, white shells in the middle <laughs> are actually shells. Um, that would have been in existence as wampum at the time the original belt was made. Um, that had great importance to me because I had hoped going to line three that more Haudenosaunee would come. But also it's, uh, it's our promise to the land because the purple represents the land, the dish, as we call it. We have the ability to take from the dish. We also have the responsibility to keep the dish clean, to protect the dish for the future generations. And why a spoon? Because remember, the treaty was made at a time when we were at war over each other over the fur trade. The French and English were quite happy with the, with, with the status quo because they got their furs however. They didn't, it didn't matter to them we were killing each other to do it. But as indigenous peoples, we said, wait a minute, we have a better way of dealing with this. We have an older way that we need to resurrect. So this has been resurrected many times over the years. Um, so the Anishinaabe, as holders of these responsibilities in this belt, also have the duty to protect the water. And that's what we're talking about today with the Canadian consulate. Um, that these aren't just concepts from a book. It's very much alive, right? My people are relearning 
our connection with the land. The slogan, land back, has only become a slogan in the last five years or so. But everything that we have done as indigenous people has been about land back. And land back isn't just the return of the land, it's the return of the knowledge of how we are to exist with the land. I like the way the Anishinaabe say it, a king, the land to which we belong. Arkanonyo, which some people call the Thanksgiving address, or it's, it's far deeper than that. You know? and, and I had to pause when I was trying to say something in English, because, and I said that you know, sometimes English is just too weak. You know, because we can have one word that means so much, you know. Uh, we didn't really have a phrase for water is life. So we asked somebody and he came up and he says, uh, uh, Oneganos Nangan Joheko. Oneganos is water. Nangan is like a connector of words. Joheko says it all. Joheko is that which sustains us. So you see the difference in meaning, and that's only scratching the very surface of it for you, you know, because it goes right to the core of who we are as indigenous people. You know, um, our longhouse burned last year. It brought my community together in a way it hadn't been in quite a while. It was a medicine for the community. People would say it was a tragedy, and yes, it was a tragedy. But what happened after that was the whole community coming out. Not just indigenous people, but our, and I hesitate to use the term allies anymore. Because I don't want allies. It's kind of weak. I want accomplices. Okay? You feel the difference? That's why when I talk, I'll, I'll ask if you feel it, because I want you to feel what I'm saying to you. I don't want you to just hear it, because there's hearing, there's listening, there's, there's different ways of absorbing what's, what, 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 uh, here I go again, different ways of absorbing information, you know? So, as I'm getting ready to come out, we had ceremony in our longhouse. And then afterwards, there was some other stuff going on. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to go for a walk on the lake because I'm going to a place and we're going to talk about protecting the water. Well, how else am I going to do that but go down and touch it? You know? When I got to Matthew's at his little lake, I put my hand in the water first thing. Brush it out. Wash my face and introduce myself. So I'm walking along. And we get a lot of signs. And I found a really, really beautiful eagle feather. And I know, because I collect them, I hunt them, I find them. And they only come to a person who has an open mind, who has an open heart, and who's doing good. So that was an affirmation for me that I was doing good, and that I could carry this message from my people to here and share it with the Canadian Council as much as I could in the short time I had. You know? So. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it.
Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to in introduce uh, Greg Michelson, who is an interdependent scientist and activist with roots in Wisconsin, currently living in Montreal. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here with, with Joe um, and also uh, to be hosted by you uh, people in, uh, in Detroit, uh, Sam and Andrew. And um, unfortunately, Andrea wasn't able to <coughs> be here. She was going to be part of the delegation as well. It's just a great honor to, um, to be part of this. And um, a big part of why Olivier, Olivier and I came from Montreal for this is uh, precisely to convey the kind of message that, that Joe just described, which is that you know, there's a long tradition of treaties that were undertaken in good faith between different peoples here <coughs> uh, on, on Turtle Island. Um, and there is a long tradition of treaties that were undertaken probably not in good faith by the United States government, but they are the highest law of the land that were made in the 19th century that have guaranteed uh, important rights to the Anishinaabe people in this area <coughs> to hunt and gather and therefore have the uh, Minoman and fish, et cetera, protected. Um, and unfortunately, in its official stances about things like pipelines, the Canadian government, the only treaty that they can remember is this 1977 pipeline agreement between the US and Canada that actually in the text of the treaty says, you know, various governments have the right to protect the environment against pipelines, but they, they don't mention that. Uh, they just pretend that this treaty um, you know, gives them the right to keep whatever pipeline they want going for as long as they want. And as long as the Canadian government is captured by the fossil fuel industry, they'll do the bidding of Enbridge and the tar sands uh, industry that Enbridge is, uh, is servicing, et cetera. So, so we came to, you know, help remind the Canadian government that there are treaties that predate this 1977 agreement that take precedence over it and that protecting the climate, protecting the water, protecting our democratic and indigenous rights are far more important than protecting the profits of a foreign corporation. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, if I need to say much more than that, but we, uh, Joe and I, you know, uh, conveyed that kind of message to a member of parliament in Ottawa about a year ago. River was there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of months ago, uh, we, we got a meeting with the Canadian uh, Minister of Environment, in which we conveyed the same idea. Um, and we're just not going to stop until the Canadian government remembers these other treaties and stops its improper use of the 1977 agreement to keep decrepit carbon bombs going when they need to, when they need to be shut down immediately. And I, yeah, I don't know if I need to say anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Matthew Bork. Um, Matthew Bork is representing himself pro se versus Warren et al., uh, which is currently being litigated. Uh, it's a, a case against a pipeline company that's responsible for the construction of the Rover pipeline here in Ann Arbor, as well as... Dakota Access Pipeline. Dapple. Yeah. Thank you. I just didn't want to say the wrong thing, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's also representing or part of the case against Enbridge here in Michigan that the state of Michigan has regarding their um, pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
So I'm like really happy that we're here in Detroit, um, and I, I want to start with this uh, kind of tradition and different backgrounds, and so I'm going to have a little, uh, I feel like I have a responsibility knowing the background of Detroit, so let me a little bit of response here, um, and an obligation uh, and, and to what has made Detroit so strong. There ain't no party like a Detroit party because a Detroit party don't stop. There ain't no party like a Detroit party because a Detroit party don't stop. There ain't no party like a Detroit party because a Detroit party don't stop. So I, I stepped into this because, again, I guess, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I used to be a chef, or I still am a chef, I suppose, uh, and not, kind of how I was connecting dots in this Canadian consulate thing was to start something, you know, that could hit close to the home, which is that, well, as a chef, like, if I don't have good products and good vegetables, good meats, like, which rely on the water, I can't make anybody any good food. Um, so about... You know, seven years ago, I went out to Standing Rock, and my whole life changed. Um, and I started taking a lot of steps forward to try and do what, everything I could to try and get some of these stories straight, because as we all know, that there's a lot of different narratives out there. Um, so I've just been trying to do my best to kind of take steps forward to that. And so I really talked to the Canadian consulate about our, our dual uh, responsibilities, being American, uh, Canada, uh, in this Great Lakes region. Um, bringing up the background of the treaties and what their responsibilities are and where that treaty came from in 1975, which was, you know, getting oil from Alaska down to the United States and what they call the Alaskan pipeline that was built in 1975. The only way to get it to the United States was to go through Canada. That's not the same story as Line 5, and as a matter of fact, Canada paused on being able to sign the treaty and the pipeline was never built. So. Pretty much the 1977 treaty is a crock of, what's the word? Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll digress. Um, and so going from there into the challenging of the 1977 treaty and their support and the use of it, taking that into effect, how line five is tied to every single one of these little troubles from Bad River all the way to 9B. And if there's one thing that they could do, they could shut down line five, especially in the Straits of Mackinac, okay? Shut it down, okay? That will, go, that, will, that will start decreasing flow to line 9B. It will be taking the steps. There's no reason to do a reroute around, uh, around Bad River if the pipeline is shut down. You know, I talked about the fact that they're not just talking about one little section. They're trying to nickel and dime these different things, and really, they're talking about a whole new pipeline, and they're not talking about replacing it because they're not going to remove the other pipeline. That just means they're adding another pipeline. And... For 99 years, looking at it in the Straits of Mackinac, what can happen? What do we know is happening with climate change and the different things that are happening in one little earthquake? Anything can happen in 99 years, and is it really that worth it? And being a back, having a background in a family that came from Detroit and being part of the Industrial Revolution, basically, over the last 100 years, is going to take another 400 years for us to be able to clean up. That's the process. That's, that's minimally where we're at right now. So if we don't start stopping some of this production, like, we're already behind the game, and we're already just catching up. So um, I'm really happy to be able to stand here in solidarity across the borders and be able to make these different connections. This has been a, a group that's been working together for a couple of years now um, and doing our best to make sure that these borders don't control us and be the best examples that we can be and to continue to fight and put ourselves out there. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you, Matthew. All right, and now I'd like to introduce Olivier, who is the member, a member of Le Vivant Se Defend, which is French for, as I surmise it to be, Life Defends Itself. Um, this is a campaign that's going on in Quebec, and I'll let Olivier take it away. Thanks. So I just want to precise something. It's it's. We are all men on the stage right now, but it was two women supposed to be this delegation. And I see mostly women in, in the room, so it's, it's a little bit strange right now, but. <laughs> so Samantha was with us and she had other meetings this afternoon and Andrea couldn't make it. 
Um, so I've been uh, uh, doing activists in Quebec for about 25 years now against fossil fuel industry. And I feel kind of uh, obliged to be here now because one of the reasons Line 5 is that important is that we've managed in Quebec to block another big pipeline going north of Ontario in Quebec, Energy East. <laughs> Thank you. So we've blocked it, and, down, and now it's going into your, your state. <laughs> because <Boo>. the... <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. It would just, just multiply, you know, but the, the joke is that uh, I heard someone said, well, we cannot pass the oil through Ontario and Quebec, so we had to pass somewhere. So, no, you could just stop it. You know, there's another answer for that. Um, and uh, so in Quebec, we'll be really successful to block uh, a lot of infra uh, new infrastructure, like uh, liquefied gas, uh, uh, tar sand pipeline, uh, energy power plant. So more and more, uh, the energy the fossil fuel energy industry uh, start to understand that there's a big X on Quebec province to any future project. Uh, and so we're going back to our old fight, like 15 years ago, they reversed the flow of Line 9 because before Line 9 was uh, uh, bringing fuel to Sarnia and because of the tar sand industry explosion, they reversed the flow in 2013 and we did a lot of action against that, and still they, they, they did it. And because we were so busy blocking other projects, we put that campaign on pause. But one year and a half ago, uh, with uh, tw 12 uh, climber activists and, and, uh, and my, um, of my friends and, and, and I, we climbed the tower uh, that is the end of, the, the, the of Line 9, which is the end of the end bridge net network, the, the, the eastern end of Enbridge network. And we stayed at for there for 24 hours, uh, and we, we managed to block like three, two or three tankers going in the St. Lawrence River for, for just one day. That's, yeah, thanks. Uh, we got a bit cold, but it was really, really one of my best days uh, in life. Uh, and one of my worst days, because I wanted to be to, to do more, <laughs> uh, but at least we did for 24 hours, and then we are, we are still in a legal process right now. We're gonna have our trial in no November, and we are doing a necessity defense for the climate. So we saying that we have the right to block fossil fuel industry in the name of climate. So I, wanna, I don't wanna brag, I just wanna tell you what's going on. <laughs> uh, and we got, when we see all that and you say, okay, so and now you're just meeting a, a guy in the consulate in Detroit. So this is like a really like little action compared to this. But for me, it's just, it's the same thing. It's the same campaign, the same strategy. Uh, it's just, um, as a climber, uh, everybody, everybody who know climbing, he says that if you climb three inch or three foot, is that is the, mo is the same importance because uh, the thing is that you have to go, you, you have, a, have to climb near, near, near your objective. And today, it's part of a, a wider strategy that uh, we talk, we, we, we say the gover to the government what we want to do, we show support to our U.S. folks that say Canadians are watching you because you're blocking the democratic process of Michigan citizen to block line five and we don't agree with that and we're watching you and we're still going to do pressure we are continue doing this and by the way uh, don't don't forget about line nine shut shut it down but shut, it down. shut, shut down line five too and shut shut all the thing down by, by the way <laughs> <laughs> and i showed in the i showed to the console the map of in, the beautiful map of andrew uh, and say oh you see all the the, the network of Enbridge, this is linking us. But no, this is not Enbridge linking us, it's the watershed, okay? Yeah, this, right. this is the, the, the lakes, the rivers, this is what's linking us today and for the future. So I, I hope that the, um, our current government will know that there's people across the border that watching us and making pressure 
And I hope they will understand that our strategy is not stopping. We will continue to press them to do the right thing. Thanks. Thank you, Olivier. And also thank you for pointing out that it is a lot of men up here. Um, and that wasn't how the, the plan was designed, but that's sort of how it shook out. Um, rather than open it up to Q&A just for this group, though, I think it would be good to hear from some impacted community members first. So maybe we'll pull a couple more chairs up here. And um, I'd love to invite Yvonne Moore and Simra, Sam, um, Luckman to come and join and, and share your stories as well. And then we'll open up to Q&A for everyone. Circle. Yeah, semi-circle. Do we have another chair? I got it. Okay. Okay, Yvonne. Ani Ivan Dijinikas. My name is Yvonne Moore, and I've been a social justice activist for probably 50 years. Um, and why am I here today? Well, I'm the mother of four, grandmother of 10, and a great-grandmother of two. I'm here to talk about missing, murdered indigenous women and relatives. The shirt that I have on is for Kayla Sadowski, who was murdered in Monroe County a year ago, February. Um, I was there for all the trial, only one of the six people who were the perpetrators in her murder actually went to trial. And once they saw what the trial was like, the, the other five plea bargained out. Um, I was impressed with the judge. He literally held them accountable for first degree murder and conspiracy of murder. So what is the connection? Missing, murdered, indigenous relatives tend to disappear around man camps. And so I've been working with some of the people around Mackinac as a water protector, and what are we gonna do when man camps do come? What's a man camp? A man camp, okay. Um, which connects to the pipelines, because when they're building the man camps, or the uh, pipeline, they have these man camps. And if any of you saw the movie Wind River, you would understand how this happens. Um, unfortunately, people have been disappearing. It's not just women anymore. It's children and it's men. And we need to be aware of the fact of what this connection is. And how can we stop you know, it's all connected, like you're saying. The water, we have to protect it. Well, we have to protect our children and our people, too. And so that's what I want to bring to you, is that as a water protector and a social justice activist, I want you to be aware of there's 27,000 American Indians, indigenous people recognized in Wayne County alone. What's the likelihood of another being, another MMIW, or missing and murdered indigenous relative? And I too was at Standing Rock, and um, I've been working also with the boarding school survivors, Every Child Matters, and the mascot issue in Michigan. We're down to less than 30 schools that have a mascot that is insulting to our indigenous people and I'm open to questions at any time if there's anything I can additionally add I'd be more than happy to thank you uh, my name is Samar Lookman I am a 30 plus year resident of southeast uh, Michigan Dearborn specifically um, I live right at the heart of what you would call the Motor City um, right where the Ford F-150 plant is, the steel mill, as well as a few thousand feet from the um, 
Marathon Refinery, which has done nothing but grow over the years. Um, and I'm here to talk about kind of the environmental impact on human health and what it does to fence line communities like my, my own. Um, specifically, like if you, we always hear the numbers of um, three times asthma rates or four times the asthma rates in this particular area, or cancer rates are double, or you know, pollution related illnesses are doubled. But when we talk about those, we kind of lose the human element. And those numbers are not just numbers. They're, they're actual people, like myself. In my family, about four of us, uh, four of my, my siblings and my son all had tumors removed. My mother is now uh, dealing with lung cancer, and I keep checking my phone because she just had a third of her lung removed. She's never smoked a day in her life, ever. My son has high blood lead levels, not because of drinking water. We drink bottled water because he breathes it through the air. He has asthma, and I can tell you as a mother, there is no scarier feeling than waking up in the middle of the night and your child screaming, Mom, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Like you just pray at that moment that the inhaler doesn't fail. You pray at that moment that it works, the steroid works. And you pray that nothing goes wrong ever a day in his life where there is not an inhaler around, a lifeline around. I'm sorry, doing a lot with my, um, my mother and, and the family issues. But. Um, so I'm going to keep my composure. So what I want you all to understand, though, is that the Line 5 issue comes back and impacts fence line communities in such a way that you can't imagine. We, we literally have neighborhoods of cancer clusters. I personally know five people who have died from nasal cancer, and that is one of the rarest forms of cancers in the United States. Five people in my community that have names, fathers, mothers, real people that have died. I can tell you my neighbor has no breasts, and she's considered one of the lucky ones because she was able to get that double mastectomy and live. Kitty corner from us, another neighbor died of breast cancer, but she was actually lucky enough to have children. Down the street from me to my right, my, my friend's dad died of kidney cancer. Down the street to my left, another girl died of breast cancer in her 20s. She wasn't fortunate enough to get married and have children. It's impacting us every single day. We don't have a choice to drink bottled air. We have to breathe the air that comes out of these, power, these plants. And it's all coming down to refineries like Marathon that are spewing sulfur dioxide or particulate matter from the steel mills. All of these things are impacting us in ways people can't imagine. Um, I would hate to see on top of the burden of, of bad air quality that we also have to deal with bad water quality. Is Flint not enough? Did Michigan not learn its lesson? Do we have to have another Enbridge accident to finally say enough is enough. Um, so uh, I just want to say that I wanna, I'm grateful to all the different people that have come together in coalitions. We are moving the needle. We really are. We're truly getting together and we're standing together. And so thank you to everybody that's here today. Thank you to all the different environmental activists that I've met in my community and outside of my community and are moving the needle. From this point forward, our demands as a coalition are not going to stop. They're only going to grow. Right now, we are demanding that they shut down these lines. Demanding, not asking. That's right. I'm, this is basically for me, I always say this, and I, I, language I think matters. It's not environmental justice, it's environmental racism. It's not just polluting the environment. It is the commission of the equivalent of state-sanctioned corporate genocide, and it needs to stop. People over profits. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, thank you for sharing really moving personal stories. Um, give, it, give it up one more time for everyone who's up here and who's put so much time into this struggle. So now I'm, I'm curious to hear if there are questions from the audience for this panel. Uh, there's a really broad set of experiences and expertise that we have here. Um, I think this is a really special opportunity to hear from a super diverse coalition. Who 
care. Yeah. Well, I think one question that I'm I have received today as, you know, some of us were on the ground supporting the action and doing outreach was, you know, what can I do? So I'm curious if there are certain steps that you would want people to take to support efforts to shut down line five, to support this campaign, or some of the other areas that you focus on. So what can I do? Well, that's the question. Yeah. What can we do? Um, there's, there's only one certain thing is that if we don't do nothing, nothing will happen. So that's the only certain thing. Sometimes you do things and it's that it doesn't come out the way you think and it uh, doesn't have this, the, the impact you hope, but at least you did something and you learned. So that would be the first answer, do something. <laughs> the first thing you got, you got in mind. And then the, th the second answer, do it with other people. At least talk, talk to them. Uh, there, there's action, there's tactics, there's technique, method, but the, the best thing is strategy. Uh, if you do something, it's better to be in a strategy uh, preferably long-term strategy, because usually in, in democracy, well, we, we're still supposed to be in democracy, uh, change our long-term long, long -term making, will change, cultural change, uh, politics change takes a long time. So that's why in Quebec we have a five-year strategy with a lot of action in it. So that would be a start of an answer. If you are, want more concrete idea, uh, right now I'm, I'm supporting the McGill University encampment pr uh, for peace in Palestine. Um, and I got a lot of message right now with folks that I, I, and I want information. Uh, so I was wondering, I don't know about the, the legals uh, here in the US, but I see that in, uh, uh, doing a camp, occupying a, a place, is really a great way to, to protest in the, in, in the long term. They, they've been there for three weeks now. And every time people go in the street, they see it. Uh, they're really pissing off their university uh, and they're asking them to divest from Israel uh, industry. Um, so that would be like maybe a concrete, uh, try thinking of a, a camp over a pipeline. <laughs> I don't know. Um, also, um, you, you can go, I just got a, a super good idea today to go to go in a swim, and uh, like a cross-border swim, maybe. That would be something to, to try. They have a canoe out. They have a canoe out where they go from Detroit to Windsor and Windsor and back. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got a concrete idea here. Um, it's called the canoe out. I don't know if you, the rest of you know about it, but it's, the water protectors take canoes from Detroit to Windsor and Windsor and back, um, which is to demonstrate how much the water is important to us. But to add to this, I have this one little philosophy. Show up. Show up to protect. Show up to protest. Show up with your voice. Show up. So um, one actionable thing that you can do here and now is um, something that brought me here today, um, just exchange numbers. You guys are all here because you care. And um, I actually met Andrew through, through a panel at U of M and we exchanged numbers and here we are today. Um, and I met somebody here as well, Amanda. Hey, shout out. Um, that we exchange numbers. And once you do, you follow up. You just, you share with each other, there's this event, that this, there's this protest, and you support each other. And when you do, there's enough people that get together, there's strength in numbers. When we show up an, en masse, people pay attention. Um, so I just think that one thing you can do here and now is just share your, your information, and then just contact each other and follow up.
<sighs> Close your eyes. Open your heart, your mind, and your ears. And listen to the world around you. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I reach for is a glass of water. And then I say my prayer. Now I say good night. Now I say good night. It's a really shortcut to a version of a much longer address which recognizes we are only a part of creation. But understanding that helps us realize that there is much that we need to do to be a part of creation. You know, we've got uh, young people that never fished before. Um, somebody said, what does lying back mean? I said, you know what lying back is? The unbridled joy that your son had in the longhouse when he received the seeds at that ceremony and the relationship that it gives him to the land. So we can all do that in some shape or form in our lives. And we will find out, and I've heard people say, I don't pray. Well, giving thanks is a prayer. It may not be a religious prayer, but it is a prayer. And it's a very strong one. So when you get up, however you do it, do it. When you go to sleep, same thing. Because you don't know if you're going to wake up to that gift again. So you give thanks for having had that gift during the day. Another part of that prayer for me is I give thanks for the gift of this day and I ask for the strength and the wisdom to do something good with it. So to me it's that basic of an action which enables us to take other actions with other people. But if we begin to relate in that way, how much better can life be? You know? And sometimes it's not a complex thing. It's that basic. So, Daniel. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> All right, I got, I, you know, I'll try and not talk to you long here, but I got a couple of things, and I'm going to put Olivier on the spot because he's a kind of a nice example on, on certain <laughs> things. I've just, uh, in this experience, I've, I've loved, like, Olivier didn't speak a lot of English when we started this organizing and has learned mm -hmm. uh, the language in order to really um, develop this relationship. Um, and so one of those things, and, it, and that's even much more difficult, or maybe not, between French and English. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is talking to other people about different things. Um, one thing that we can do all the time is to talk to other people about things, whether it's in the grocery store, whether it's over in, across the country, over here, over there. And although, you know, we, we think, you know, we all here in the States speak English, there's a big difference between how they speak English in California and New York. And so there's an understanding while we're making these relationships so that we're talking to these people and making sure that we understand one another because it's not even really about the words all the time as much as the feeling behind the different things um, because everybody might understand things differently than we do. And so there's a real big importance to going out there every day and still we're in working on that communication thing to talk to one another. Um, and spread different messages. Um, something that people can do right now. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, everybody's heard, everybody's heard of this place called Bad River, okay? If anybody hasn't and they want to look up online right now, they can look at Bad River. There's this wonderful film 
Okay, it's now publicly available to stream if you know somebody that has Xfinity cable and you can share with your friends. It's a wonderful educational documentary about the movement and the people of Bad River. You can do it through Zoom. You can host a, an event at your house and bring together people and start working on the different education uh, throughout across the board so that we understand a lot of these different languages and, and these different stories because uh, we're now finally starting to, uh, the, the stories are being supported to come back um, and sharing those stories is amazing. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to go on is when you see all these people and they're fighting, uh, it's not an easy fight. Um, it's a long fight. So support them. Support your brothers and sisters throughout this whole zone and know that we're all going through different things um, and that that support is what keeps us going every single day. Thank you. Well, I might just uh, mention that um, you know what we did today and what we're doing now is uh, just one campaign that kind of builds on uh, you know previous actions over the past year and a half or so. But um, like the next steps are are unclear, um, and I would just invite anybody who's interested in um, getting involved with. Uh, you know, activists across many, uh, Michigan, sorry, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ontario, Quebec, to um, get in touch with the cross-border organizing working group. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we, we need ideas about uh, other, you know, kind of um, strategic uh, campaigns to engage in over, you know, un until we win these fights. So I would just, just to put in a bit, a bit of a plug um, for that. How do we get in touch? Uh, one way is um, CBOWG, which stands for Cross Border Organizing Working Group, at protonmail.com. I think most of you probably know Andrew, so uh, he can also um, hook you up. And it's been, it's been really neat to see how the Detroit team has come together to organize this event, and, and it's been a real thrill. Next week, there's going to be a similar but interestingly different kind of event um, with the same general purpose of getting these pipelines shut down in Minneapolis because there's a consulate there. And then this summer, there's going to be one in Chicago. Uh, I think I mentioned that we've already had a couple of events in, um, in Canada, and we hope to have another one in, in Ontario to, to bring that province in. So um, there's a lot of fantastic and courageous and creative uh, resistance happening in many different places. And one thing that the cross-border organizing working group has tried to do is to, um, you know, help those movements get even stronger by forging connections between them. Awesome. Thank you all so much for those great ideas. Um, I see a hand up in the audience. Jenny, what's your question? Hey, I would really like to know more about what happened at the meeting. Jenny would really like to know more about what happened at the meeting. Particularly how long it was, how was the message received? How long it was, how was the message received? How many people showed up? How'd it go? Paint us a picture. Sure. So uh, there, were, there were five of us there, and there was... Um, uh, a Canadian official, his title is the Consul of Political Affairs or something. He's not the Consul General, so the, the highest ranking official in the uh, Detroit Consulate is, uh, thank you, <laughs> is, is the Consul General, but this was the um, Consul of, um, it actually doesn't say what his title is. Foreign Policy and Diplomacy Service. Well, that, that's the general. Oh, okay. uh, so it's just a Consul. Anyway. <laughs> And, and he, was very, uh, he was very, you know, welcoming and polite, except for one thing, and that is um, apparently the staff there got so freaked out by the publicity they saw about, you know, um, this, uh, this action that we're doing right now, um, that they didn't want to let us into the actual consulate, which is on, you know, one of the upper floors. So they actually had us meet kind of out in the middle of, 
just out in the open uh, in the atrium of the building. In the big corridor. There was a bit of there was a bit of yeah there, there was a bit of noise. Yeah, I mean he they did have but you know so so that was uh, kind of an adverse move I would say and and you never know how they're gonna, gonna react in that way, but during the meeting he was very polite and he he listened very well and he promised to convey the messages that we. Uh, gave um, all the way up to his superiors, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who's the one who invoked this 1977 agreement to mess with Bad River and to mess with your governor mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, Secretary um, Attorney General and to mess with uh, other ongoing um, litigation. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that uh, that he will tra transmit that message, but but hopefully by you know putting together a lot of um, different kinds of action, including this one, we'll get the job done sometime soon. In about an hour. <laughs> yeah. We a we actually we actually did about an hour actually with him. Is that right? Yeah. Now. I was I was asked to speak first. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> it's <the> time to talk. <laughs> I did that in the longhouse once and my phone went off and I said, oh, I guess it's time to sing. <laughs> <laughs> now I leave it in the truck. But um, I asked him to hold this belt while I spoke. Because like I said, it's a replica. The beads are a clay polymer. But there are real wampum in this belt that are dated to around 1650. So there's a lot of power in this thing. And I could see his hands just kind of wavering a little bit. You know? I mean, like, all that. <laughs> you know, if you're used to it, you just hold it like this. You know, maybe if I had too much coffee, you're going to go a little bit like that. Yeah, about 15 minutes. Yeah, so he was holding it, and you could see his hands were moving slightly, you know. And so I think I, I, I got the uh, desired effect, you know. I think there's a difference between listening and hearing. Um, he listened very intently. I'll say that, I thought. Anyway, um, and what he does with that information, uh, I hope he does. I hope he does exactly what he said he's going to do for us. You know, because uh, I've I've had meetings where I've talked to people, and you can tell they're not listening. They're looking down. They're doing something else. You know, they're, although some people just doodle. So there was one guy that I was wrong about, but that's just what he does. You know, um, like I say. He felt it. I, yeah, I was just gonna say he, you know, didn't just listen. Like he actually took notes on all the different things. He asked questions. Like there was a dialogue that kind of happened, and you know where it started is a little bit more of an intense thing. As the meeting carried on, like it got looser and looser, and it became, it became more, you know, conversation-wise, where. Uh, it became a very open meeting um, from a uh, you know, little rocky start of uh, you know, weirdness and un uncertainty and really developed into, okay, we're actually really having a conversation here and we're bouncing around between different people and he's asking questions, he's, he's taking notes and he's saying, yes, I'm going to take this, you know, it's my job to investigate some of this stuff and uh, bring it to my bosses and their bosses and their bosses and so yeah, that's where he said we're, we're taking this to the top. Well, he, 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 at least he gave us a piece of information. He said that line five issues keep him really occupied. Yeah. Yep. So I think it's, uh, that's uh, encouraging. <laughs> that's me, that means that we're doing a great job. But uh, he's a really good listener. I, I, I really felt that like he's really a Canadian politics guy. That means he's a great listener, but don't do a lot of things. Um, but to be fair, he's, he got no executive power, so 
I think our campaign, our combined strategy is more like uh, blooming, like, is this the right word? Like uh, flowers blooming all over the watershed. And today we did one bloom at this place and hopefully there will be others. <laughs> And 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 oh, by the way, was really glad to speak French with somebody. <laughs> Were you able to take photos and video inside? Uh, yeah, we got photo. Awesome. Two, two or three photos. Yeah, mm. got a photo of him. I hold his dog. Wonderful. Got some photos inside. Cool. Other questions? Um, I have a question for you, uh, Olivia. If, if you could maybe talk about some tactics that were successful in your campaigns in Quebec. Like, what do you think was the strong points of those campaigns that actually applied the correct pressure to get these uh, pipelines blocked? The question is, uh, what tactics were effective at getting the pipelines blocked in Quebec? Um, really strong coalition and really strong strategy, basically. And then after that, when you plan action, it could be anything. You, you meet a consulate, you do a petition, you do a walk, uh, you do um, like a kayak activist thing <laughs> with many kayak on the water. Then uh, it all connects and the pressure gets higher and higher. One thing that uh, we was really successful against Energy East pipeline project is people going in the city halls of every town that the the project was uh, was affecting, and they went every month. I did. I was living in su East suburban Montreal at that time, and we went every month asking question about that. And one of the turning point against this pipeline project is when. The, the whole uh, Montreal community region, which is like 80 cities, uh, they, they express themselves uh, against this project. So, and just the Montreal region is half the population of Quebec, because it's really concentrated in the south. And at this point, like the, the provincial and federal government had seen to, they, they, f they feel like they had no more legis legitimacy. But so the, the fight for energy is, more concretely for your answer, was win in the city hall. But Olivier, don't forget, um, they also, there was a brewery, because there's a lot of microbreweries in Quebec, and they came up with uh, a, a beer called Culpa Chez Nous, which means, uh, well, can you translate don't spill that? In our, don't spill in our land. Yeah, so they came up with an anti-pipeline beer, and yeah. may maybe that played a, maybe that played a small part. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. It's, it was really an important part of the strategy. <laughs> but you know, beer connects people, so everything that connects people help. But the the the, the, the to be serious, uh, be crea being creative is the key. You know, because uh, when you do heart beautiful things. People that you don't have the are not in our fight can connect with with our struggle. Thanks, Olivier. Other questions over here. I'm curious. Um, in Canada, for the grassroots organizers, um, is there much funding? So one thing that we really struggle with, right, are the grassroots organizers don't often have funding. Um, and we're just, yeah, we'd love to know more about, like, how you guys create time for yourselves and if you if you get funding and how. And if there's nonprofits that are supportive, you know, of this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, angle at chipping away at this problem. So the question is, how do groups get funding for this stuff in Canada? We're, we're so broke. Uh, I'm not a good example because uh, I'm, I'm really kind of a, a lot of energy, more 
the average activist of my friends. So I'm not the typical activist Quebec guy. But still, uh, that's mean that I, I do a lot of things voluntary and not being paid. But we're working on it. There's more and more foundation and group that are willing to fund uh, activism, not just like bef like 10 years ago, they, they were really afraid of a uh, direct action or disturb things, even though it does not directly, specifically civil disobedience. Like, oh, you wanna, you wanna create problems, we're not gonna give you money. We, we just want uh, education things. And, and now, the, even in those really money foundation people in suits uh, place, the people, I feel people are getting, are starting to getting the urgency and starting that the, our system cannot protect us from climate crisis, we have to do more. So uh, we are now really uh, tr uh, starting to get some funds to do direct action. But uh, what, for what I see with the cross-border organization, we, uh, we are not better than you on, for the, on the funding level. <laughs> And, and I'm also a kind of a novice activist myself and, and certainly way new to trying to get funding for it. But I do, do want to acknowledge the Sierra Club, who uh, Sierra Club Wisconsin uh, funded the trip by some activists to Montreal, um, where there was a teach-in about line three, line five, and line nine. It was very inspiring. They had key people who had been involved in all three fights. Uh, and it was at that um, teach-in where the cross-border organizing group was, was born. Um, very recently, Sierra Club uh, US has given Sierra Club Canada a chunk of money to work on line five, okay? So, and I think this is really key because Canada has, the, the Canadian government has played such a reprehensible role in, in keeping line five going. It, it's, it's, it's a really good um, move that uh, Sierra Club Canada now has money and uh, incentive to work on it there. And they funded uh, Olivier, Olivier and my trip here. So they, they paid for our train ticket. Anyway. I, I forgot one thing. Don't, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, because one thing, what the, the first question was, what can we do? So you can, you can fund your friends, <laughs> you can give money to people who are in action, um, if you can, if you can. Uh, so just an example, we, for the legal uh, uh, suit we have, uh, we, it's really expensive because, because of it, we have a, a team of lawyers and we have a expert testimonies and we really want to fight uh, for climate in a court. And then we, we really did ask people for help, and we managed to uh, gather over three thirty thousand dollars, thirty thirty three thousand dollars, just to pay the lawyers. So it's it's that's and it's just like twenty or fifty dollar five dollars uh, donation for about a, a year and a half. So don't be afraid, as least as at least just say that you need support and. Oh, by the way, when we when we were organizing the big action, and I told uh, uh, we had uh, at some point we were we didn't have enough money for the gear, and somebody called us and say, "Oh, I got a lead of an anonymous donor. He wanted to give you ten thousand dollars to do direct action," and then we just received this money, and then we could we were able to do the action. So. Just, just say it, and some, uh, sometime it happens. <laughs> I wanted to add that that's so real, and I appreciate that. I think that I kind of said like big greens, like sarcastically, but it's so true that there's money that we can get from those big organizations, and I think some of them are are and have been becoming a little bit more aware of the negative impact they've had, particularly on the direct most impacted communities. Mm -hmm. So I think asking, I think building our network, because I know a lot of people and always have were like, good job, Jen, or I'm so proud of those folks that did that thing. And so really being clear that we need money to live to do that thing and just pushing that out, I think is really important. But this is news today. Came to my email box. 
Um, I'm connected with Michigan Alliance for Justice and Climate. And so if you know those folks, Juan sent this out this morning. Eagle, most of you know Eagle Eagle. Eagle is our Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Eagle announces 20 million available for Michigan's first ever environmental justice impact grants. And, so we're gonna need some fancy grant writers, right? Because we're not gonna directly fund what we want to do, but we can get some good grant writers. And, applications for place-based and equity-focused projects are open now. Applications need to be received by July 15th, so we've got a little more time than sometimes we'll hear about things at the last minute. And, this includes federally recognized tribes, community-based nonprofits, and grassroots and frontline organizations. So let's try to work evil. Uh, uh, you, there's one thing to add to that, Jenny, uh, is that you need a sister group to do it with, is one of the things. Because, and yes, grants is a great way to do funding, uh, supplies, and different things, but building out teams. Uh, that can organize those different things because there is m sometimes more aid out there and it's just trying to figure out and work those networks and and being clear in the ask because there's a lot of organizations that come forward and say we, we uh, you know how can we help we want, we're here to help you and so we're always struggling with trying to say oh well we could use this we can use this and maybe we should change some of those questions with answering with well how can you help us how you know Tell us how you can help us so that we can work together and try and figure out those narratives and figure out how to speak the same language because I do think that there's more support out there. It's just kind of how people speaking the same language um, so that, yeah. You can do what needs to get done. I had a conversation with somebody recently who I didn't know had money. Hmm? And I, was, I said something like, I need to know like, who are the people with money? And he <laughs> talked to me a little bit about the Buckminster Grant and I talked to him a little bit some of the money I was looking for for Palestine organizing. And he wrote the organization a check for a thousand dollars like in two days. And so I think that whole idea of talking it up, letting people know, because you don't know who are the people with money or connected to money, always. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Montreal, my friends in Cincinnati sent me 200 bucks. Um, I'm not the nonprofit type of guy. Uh, I went to Sierra Club once, and they said, yeah, we got funding for you to travel, and, and they wanted a 1099. I'm like, uh, yeah, I ain't doing that. You know, I need to be a little more covert. Um, I got friends that got gas stations. So when I'm going east, I'll stop at one guy's place. When I'm headed west, I'll stop there, I'll di although I didn't come that way. So, you know, when I went to line three, A friend of mine put it out to her group. Next thing I know, my friend's at Burning Books. It's a really great bookstore. You can order from them online, find the uh, radical books you can't find elsewhere. They're beautiful people. Um, somebody working at the bookstore says, you need to come in here. There's a whole bunch of envelopes waiting here for you with your name on them. And that's how I got back and forth to line three, okay? Those same folks, when I saw them, said, if you need in the future, let me know. That is such a beautiful thing because I'm not one to ask. It's just the way I was brought up. Because whenever I asked, I didn't get, so you just don't ask anymore. But now I've come to the realization that people that want to help out, that may be the only way they can. Because we aren't all cut out to be on the front line for seven months in a yurt. But we can certainly acknowledge those people that help us stay there because we don't do it on our own. When I came back from line three, and this is pretty personal, so please don't share this part of it. One of my elders said to me, 
we sent some strong prayers out your way. Did you feel them? I said, oh yeah, I sure did. And he told me, he said, when you go again, let us know. We'll take care of you. So there are a lot of ways that we can help each other out. Meetings, one woman had meetings in her house. You know, raise some funds that way. There's so many different ways that we can educate ourselves and educate each other, um, you know, without having to be on the front line long term, you know. But the front lines are everywhere. And they're not going away. And once we become the sort of people that confront those issues, we can never go back. Because once you've awakened yourself, you can never go back. You know? When I cross that river, I don't call it what they call it. To me, I say I'm on the other side of the lake, or I'm on the other side of the river, and they call it something else, an international border. But it's just that little, little thing, you know? Decolonize. Anybody else? Yeah, how are we with cameras? I think we cut there for a second. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, thank you guys so much. I just really appreciate this conversation. I just kind of stumbled upon being here. Um, I just felt it feels really meaningful and important. So thank you. Um, I really appreciated the this. this speaking to being in the moment and just appreciating the waters for what they are and also for what can we do, just having conversations with people. But I think of how important it is to have conversations with people that don't agree with me. And I think of conservative people in my family who are difficult to talk to about this kind of stuff. And I think of what they'll say and when I do try to bring these things up, well, what, what, what will we have them do when we, di when we disrupt these pipelines fully? Well, what, what, will, they, what, should, what will we have them do? We need oil. We need these things. People that can't think imaginatively or creatively outside of these things that we rely on. And I'm wondering, for people that have been in the game longer than I have, how to keep those conversations going with people that think the U.S., where, whoever, wherever we are, right, we call it that now, has a right to put these things in place, how to have those conversations and maintain them to keep disrupting so we can't win. Thank you. I think the most important thing is when you're talking to people about this issue particularly for me because line five and how it impacts the water if something should go wrong in Mackinac is huge. And I don't think people understand that if there's an oil leak in the water, how serious that is. And I think that's the most important thing is like, um, you need water to live and oil and water don't mix. And I think if you really talk about how that is going to impact everybody, ultimately, is so important. I, I mean, that's been my experience, that they, they don't get it until you say, uh, if it explodes, then what? You can't drink anymore? You need water. And I, I, that's just my recommendation. I hope that's helpful. So, um, yeah, there are going to be those people that dismiss everything. Um, uh, there was once a state rep that, that told his community that he didn't believe that there were high environmental health impacts. Um, and 
you know, you're not going to be able to change their minds. But sometimes people need that human element. You know, like, why am I here? I'm, I'm here because I want to show you the humanity of somebody dying from health impacts, right? That's what community uh, members, impacted members, are brought onto panels like this for, is to, to appeal to your, your human side, your empathy. And while there are data points that you can point out to these people, sometimes they need to actually meet or hear a story of somebody that has been impacted and appeal to their humanity. And you're not going to change everybody. There are going to be people, like I said, that just always, always ignore and dismiss us, and, and that's fine. But at some point, there's going to be somebody that does listen and does change your mind. And that's the person that's the target. That's the person who is listening in and is interested um, and is going to change their mind down the road and become an ally. We didn't start here as people that were environmental activists. We started as laymen, right? Um, but eventually, having the compassion for others, we became what we are today. And I think that's, that's the goal, really, is to, you know, I'm not saying waste, don't waste your time. It's definitely an investment, a good investment to try to convince people. But there are other things that you want to incorporate in your conversations that may, may appeal to them a little more. Um, so I, I want to speak uh, because I feel like I'm, I'm familiar with uh, some of the situation. I come from a very conservative family, and I live in that house to this day because my, my family, they're great people, but they wouldn't let me be homeless, and it allows me to continue to do this work. But there's Fox News plays four hours a day, and so um, I, I feel like I kind of understand where you're coming from on this question, um, and it's, I'm not going to say it's, this is an easy task but I'm going to start with something really small with planting seeds. Um, you know, every different state, different people kind of have this different energy. And when, if there's one thing about Michigan, people from Michigan, is they're extremely proud and they want to feel like they're smart and they want to feel like they're educated. And so uh, us trying to throw the facts down in their face to, like, just doesn't work a lot of times. It's, it's how do you inspire them to do the research provide them the tools so that they can educate themselves through the different things. The other diff most difficult thing is patience, right? How to have these conversations without, without getting angry and just constantly being that grounding for them, an example for them where they can kind of come to you eventually to find some of these answers. And it's just planting those little seeds and finding it, and you never know, and you can't force the seed plant. It's just finding that one opportunity to make one comment that sticks in their brain. And they, because normally you're just, you're dealing with a, a brick wall all the time. And so, and they're constantly being flooded through this whole process because they're watching this other media and they're being brainwashed. Like it's no joke. It's straight up brainwashing. And they watch it over and over, and they're repeating it over and over and over and over again. So the, the only, best way that I have kind of found to kind of work on that is to be the best example I can be, but to plant seeds along the way and find a one little thing through a dinner conversation. You know, um, yeah. All right, quick time check is almost four o'clock. It's 3.57. Um, any other burning questions? Yeah, totally. I think that's a great sort of transition maybe into the next phase. Let's uh, give the panelists a big round of applause. Thank you. And I would love, Ruby, if you want to come up and make your announcement and also invite anyone else who might have announcements that are relevant to share in such a rad gathering of people. Thank you so much, um, everybody, and Jen for getting me up here. Um, I entered this year um, 
with what I always do, um, a burning in and burning out ritual on New Year's Eve. And I make a list of things I want to let go of and the things that I want to bring in. And this year I didn't have a whole lot that I wanted to let go of, but what I wanted to bring in um, were infinite possibilities. And <laughs> by April of this year, I found myself um, accepting the position as a co-chair for the Great Lakes Bioneers Conference that's coming up in October. And I have been a presenter for some years, but I certainly never thought I would ever be in a position of um, helping to organize the conference. And today, when I was working in the garden and I just wanted to check my emails, I saw this flyer and so I thought, you need to be there. And I would like all of you um, to take my information. I brought some flyers um, because all of what we're talking about um, is what we deal with um, at our conference. And we are always seeking um, presenters or sponsors. Um, I'd like that uh, link to the grant, grant Jen. Um, and so please do um, stay open, be active. Um, my um, superpower is prayer. So don't forget to pray, even if it's just a, um, a thank you when you wake up each morning, I, I could hear and understand that sentiment. Um, so um, that's what I'd like to say. The um, conference will be October 17th and 18th on the campus of the University of Detroit Mercy um, School. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. I'd like to share the words of uh, a good friend of ours. Her name was Joy Braun, one of the first people to put up a teepee out at Standing Rock, and one of our matriarchs of the movement. And what she said is, we trained 10,000 of you in direct action. So there should be 10,000 direct actions around Apple. But that is just as true for Line 5 or any of, the other, any of these other extreme extraction um, projects that you know, we have to stop. And those, what constitute those direct actions? is up to each and every one of you. Because some can take extreme action and some can't. But all of us need support along the way. So, you know, start thinking about your next direct action. We're here. We all showed up. Okay, Danny Holt. I'm going to just add a uh, real quick um, plug. So um, uh, I'm a vice president of the Friends of the Rouge, which is um, an organization, a uh, nonprofit that um, protects the Rouge waterway. Basically, the Rouge River covers anything from Canton all the way down to the Detroit River. Um, and so if you love our waters um, and want to join, there's strength in numbers. Um, please see me and I can connect you. You can come and connect and network with a lot of people during our fundraising dinner um, or just join the mailing list so you know how you can help uh, keep our waters clean and safe. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple, this is, this is an announcement about other future actions, ways to plug in. Um, first of all, how do I want to frame this? Okay, here's a graph. 
Basically, you're going to see a green line on the bottom. That's the amount of trees that have been extracted over the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, oh, sorry, this is, this is 50 years. Then there's the orange. It also stays about the same. That's uh, non-metallic minerals. Then there's the blue bar at the top. That also stays about the same. That's metal. And then there's the gray. And the gray is the thing that like, really grows over the past 50 years, and that's fossil fuel extraction, right? So this kind of ties into the question about, like, oh, well, how can we survive without the fossil fuels? Um, and the answer is that we've been doing it. Um, we've been doing it for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, right? <clears throat> now, with that increase in fossil fuel extraction, we have increased the refinement. Marathon, which Sam talked about, is a refinery that's in Detroit. And they are also, they just applied for a permit to expand their operations, right? Right now, they're capped at 140,000 barrels per day of what they can refine, and they want to exceed that. Um, there's a hearing on the 22nd. I'm looking for the details, but that's something that directly impacts our community members here. That's going to increase the amount of tar sands that can be extracted and refined overall. Um, and we need to organize around. So if you want to get involved in that fight, um, we're going to all, all um, plug into Great Lakes Water Protector Network. If you can follow Great Lakes Water Protector Network, it's at Water Protector Network on Instagram. Um, we'll keep you updated with respect to ways to plug into that fight. And the other thing that I want to share is this graphic of the uh, meander in Bad River. This is talked about more in the Bad River documentary that Matthew plugged, but Bad River, for those who don't know, is a federally recognized tribe up on the shores of Lake Superior, and Enbridge is trespassing and has been found guilty of trespassing on their land. They're operating Line 5 right now for what's going on 10 years of trespassing. Um, and this meander is where the river is about to eat away the riverbank and expose the pipeline. And because of that, they are working to reroute Line 5 around the Bad River Bands Reservation. Um, there's a lot of issues with that. I'm not going to go into all those details right now, but I will say that is going to be a battleground and that we need water protectors to show up and there are a lot of ways to support. So Bad River, the Marathon plant, these are both going to be sites for people who care to show up and take action in a good way. Any other announcements? Water is life! Water is life! Mini with Tony! Mini with Tony! Mini with Tony! <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, I encourage everyone to shake it out, drink some water, go outside, feel the sun in the air, and um, we'll be around if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you. All of you, thank you so much. Thank you for yeah, me. you did great. I appreciate you. I'm always so nervous. Thank you so much. It didn't show at all. It didn't show, really. <laughs> so embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying no. to control my No, not at all. It's so sorry. It's so yes. Yeah. Thank you. No, I would love one, though. Thank you so much. Miss oh, Ruby. Yeah. Um, okay. Bye. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, wait, girl. I will see you again soon, hopefully. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you need from me? No. Thank you so much for all your time. Sure. Um, I'm pretty sure. I think that, you know, if you want to think of like a quote to put in the press release, sure. you'd be welcome to. Okay. Or if you want to help me and say I said it. Okay. <laughs> I said some great shit, so I can probably just pull something you said already. Okay. That's fine. Whatever you want.
No, no, I did forget to mention when I was saying about the updates. Marathon did come up. We did talk about the air pollution with a, like, it was something like when I said marathon, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're and so fighting the city, too. We were talking about, and he just was very aware of, like, oh, yes, that's where Line 5 is used here. Yeah, and exactly. yes, oh, and, and so <laughs> the expansion of marathon yes. means that Line 5 is going to happen. Yes. Well, so, well I, I just talked, I talked to him about, like, the centers and the, like, how bullshit the sensors actually are. Like, they're, like they're not, yeah. Oh, like, they self-monitor. Well, it's not even that. It's that they don't <laughs> capture, I mean. They, they don't literally even do, do. They don't even do that. They, the whole system kind of is, but the, the air monitor, they only give you a pass-fail. They don't actually collect any real data. But we also have. Like, well, there's the monitors. just air monitors. That are we, have, we also have eagle monitors, but pass they fail. violate. So yeah. even with the thousands of violations, yes. oh, right. it, it, just, it wait, said specifically on the thing for marathon, it says you can't use this data for court. Uh, actually, they actually, because it only sp uh, like small.